This video is brought to you by Squarespace. How's it going everybody? Chaotic Meatball here and welcome back to the channel. So today it's about time I finally do a Nuzlocke in the Alola region. But not just one Nuzlocke, but two Nuzlocke's. This Alolan form only Nuzlocke is a companion piece to a Cantonian form Nuzlocke over on Beast Coast Pokemon. So I've made sure to put a link in the description, so go over there and subscribe for more Pokemon content from myself. Not just exclusive challenges, but the history of the Pokemon trading card game, tier lists, Unite content, event vlogs, there's going to be a bunch of stuff over there. Anyway, this Nuzlocke is probably one of the weirdest I've done, since it's not a monotype. Though sometimes it can feel like it with how many dark types I'll have by the end. There's nine Pokemon to choose from, those being Raticate, Persian, Muk, Dugtrio, Raichu, Marowak, Golem, Ninetales and Sun version, Sandslash is only available in Moon version, and Executor. So I'm going to be stuck with 9 even though there's 10 in existence. We've got a pretty good amount of types available to us though, but I would listed those in order of availability. If you think that Hull is going to be a brick wall on the first island, you'd be absolutely right. Having three dark types and a steel type exclusively before then is going to make this an absolute pain, so I'll have to strategize effectively. But before we get into our encounters and battles, I'd like to talk about today's sponsor, Squarespace. Squarespace is a one-stop shop platform to build an online presence and even run a business, giving you the tools necessary to build a website, set up an online store, and even give you marketing tools and analytics. I've actually been interested in doing two things recently, starting a website as a hub for all of my content while giving myself a place to journal and post random stuff that wouldn't exactly fit on a YouTube community post, but Squarespace lets me do just that. By using one of their pre-formatted layouts, I was easily able to adjust the pictures, add hyperlinks, and write some handy captions for the up-and-coming creators out there. All of that only took around 20 minutes to put together, and it looks clean and easy on the eyes. So if you want to create a website of your own, head to squarespace.com for a free trial, and when you're ready to launch, go to squarespace.com meatball to save 10% off your first purchase of a website or domain. Thanks once again to Squarespace for sponsoring this video, I'll be leaving a link to the website I created through their service in the description, and I'd appreciate it if you checked it out. With that said, let's get into the game. My first encounter isn't actually going to be until after the second rival battle, in which Hal hands my bum to me on a silver platter thanks to me not really training Rowlet, but that's fine as we're going to throw it into the box as soon as I capture this Rattata in the Howly outskirts. I'm going to be EV training this thing as much as I can in HP and balancing defense and special defense, but with the first totem Pokemon's level cap being 12, I don't exactly have much room to work with. But with Rattata in hand, I'm able to run back over to Route 1 to grab Pichu. I won't be able to get Raichu for a while, seeing as the earliest Thunderstone in the game is on Route 8 over on Akawa Island, but I know that I'll be training this in Special Attack and Speed EVs. This game has 38 fights that I'd consider to be important, so in case you think I'm glossing over some things, it's because this game is ridiculously long and I don't want to present a Nuzlocke video that's over an hour, especially when this is a pair of videos. You'll probably be tired of Alola after two runs too, but I digress. First up on our list is jumping ahead into Howoli City. By this point, I've picked up Alolan Meowth from the Trainer School, which will be trained in Special Attack and Speed, as well as Grimer from Howoli City itself. This one's a bit of a bulky attacker, so I'll be sticking with HP and attack EVs for this one. After taking care of some Team Skull Grunts, Ilima wants to battle to see if we're ready for his trial, so of course we accept his request. He's got two Pokemon, the first being Young Goose, who's relatively easy to take out with Rattata, as we've got Bite at our disposal. Three of those puts Young Goose into healing range while I tried to snipe with Quick Attack on the fourth turn, getting it critical, but he actually used a potion before then, so it's not enough. A fourth bite lands as his own tackle does some high damage due to two leers earlier, but another quick attack seals the deal with Smeargle replacing him. Of course I got a swap here and my best option is Grimer. I've got a bit of HP with this thing and Poison Gas should be able to hit as it has much higher accuracy here in Gen 7 and sure enough it does. However, I know he's got a full heal, so I go for it again, then swap for Meowth to start taking in some more damage as Poison takes care of him. Fake out stalls for a turn, then Bite's able to take him out for the win. At the end of the battle as well, Meowth evolves into Persian as this is done through Max Friendship rather than being at level 28 for Kanto Persian, so I'll have quite the advantage going into the totem Pokemon. 
Speaking of which, Totem Gumshoes is quite the problem. It's a 2-on-1 scenario after the first turn, he's got boosted stats, and he's got a Pecha Berry. But as long as I lead Grimer, I can hit a Poison Gas, waste the Pecha Berry, he then calls his ally, and I use it again, and it poisons both Gumshoes and the assisting Young Goose. This is exactly what happens, and thanks to Grimer's high HP and defense, I'm able to swap out on 3 quarters HP for Rattata just to absorb a turn's worth of damage and let that poison rack up, then swap into Persian for a fake out on Gumshoes. Young Goose really can't do much damage without a defense drop, so focusing on the Gumshoes and ensuring it goes down while the little guy just wails there with Tackle is the smartest thing I can do. Since I can't attack with Fake Out again, I swap for Grimer, taking a scary face from Gumshoes and a tackle from Young Goose, which triggers the Citrus Berry that I got over on Route 2, bringing me back to 75% HP. Another scary face and Leer combo comes out of the two as I swap back into Persian, but no matter what, Fake Out has priority, nearly taking out Gumshoes with the poison, so I just go for Swift, outspeeding and finishing both of them off and getting out of the fight relatively safely. Very happy to have a fully evolved Pokemon at this point, because if I didn't, I would probably wouldn't be able to make it out of this fight without any casualties. Normalium Z in hand, there's actually one required battle between here and the Grand Trial, that being against Hao and his two Pokemon. But first, I've got to grab a Lowland Diglett from the Verdant Cavern, as well as Eevee train both that and Pichu for the fights ahead. The former gets trained in attack and speed, so we're pretty much set. However, the Melee Melee Grand Trial is a fighting user, and we've got three Dark Types and a Steel Type, so I'm gonna have to draft in Pichu for this fight despite not being in Alolan form just yet. One last thing before how, I made sure to max out Pichu's happiness so that it evolves at level 13 exactly, as Pichu learns Nasty Plot at this level, then evolves, and since Pikachu learns Electro Ball at this level as well, I have both moves learned and at my disposal for the fights ahead. Pretty nasty combo early game, I must say, especially with Pikachu's base 90 speed, and backed by Charm to lower physical attack, we should be set. How has two Pokemon, first of which is Pikachu, so I lead with Diglett, using Magnitude and getting a 9 to immediately kill this thing, leading into Poplio. Of course, I've got to swap out here, and since Pikachu's got the type advantage, taking a critical disarming voice on Switchin and nailing an Electro Ball for a two-shot KO while taking a Water Gun for minimal damage is pretty simple, leaving just Hala. This could end very poorly if I don't max out my EVs as much as humanly possible, which unfortunately I can't do with Pikachu or Persian since the lowest level thing with special attack EVs at this point are level 6 Magnemites, which provide a decent chunk of experience to the detriment of me, but it should be enough for now. Hollow leads off with Mankey, so of course I'm going Pikachu here, leading off with Charm as he uses Karate Chop, immediately setting off Static. That's going to be really nice for some stun turns, but that doesn't happen on the second or third turn of Charm as two more Karate Chops land, triggering Pikachu's Orin Berry as we use Sweet Kiss, confusing Mankey as well. Now that he's starting to be stunned out, I can go for Nasty Plot, getting a free one as he uses Focus Energy, then using a second as he hits himself in confusion. I debate between going for Electro Ball and the third Nasty Plot, but because of that focus energy earlier, I just click Electro Ball, taking out Mankey, and Makahita comes in second. It uses Fake Out on the first turn, doing some damage to Pikachu, but not enough to take it out, so Electro Ball is able to follow up next turn for the KO, leaving just Craballer. He's unable to get off his Z-move in time, going down in one shot and winning me the Fighting EMZ. Nasty Plot sweeping one of the first major trainers is kind of funny, but boy that could have gone horribly wrong at any point if that status stacking up was not going to work. Now that we've escaped with our lives intact though, I get Tauros Charge as well as a few new items like the TM for Thief, opening up the floodgates for things like Hard Stones from Rog and Rolla, as a few of our Pokemon get Fling later on and the Hard Stone makes it a 100 power physical dark move. Metal Coat from Magnemite, as well as 6 leftovers from Munchlax, as they have a 100% chance to hold them in this game. With all those in hand though, Akala Island is the next target where Dexio and Cena seem to be taking a vacation. Well, I can't be having a mediocre Pokemon game's characters invading my actually good modern Pokemon game now can I, so I'm going to kick their butts. Dexio leads off with Slowpoke, so I go with Rattata, spamming Bite twice as a Water Gun lands for light damage, essentially being negated thanks to turn turns of Leftovers Recovery, leading to Espeon. 
It has Quick Attack, which does do a bit of damage, but once again, two bites puts him down, winning us the battle. This is around where I started following WarTab's world record speedrun for Sun and Moon, doing my best to avoid any trainers as we still haven't maximized our EVs out yet, but I'm not exactly perfect doing this on my first try, so I do run into the occasional trainer I don't need to every now and again. Alolan hops up here in Paniola City though, ready for another fight, so let's bring him down. Once again, he's only got two Pokemon, so I use the same strategy as before, leading with Diglett and using Magnitude on his Pikachu, but only getting a four, so that didn't work out well, but the second lands innate as Quick Attack does barely anything to me, leading to Brion. I try swapping out into Grimer here to stand up to Disarming Voice, using a mix of Poison Gas and Acid Spray as he uses a myriad of Disarming Voices and Aqua Jets in the attempt to whittle Grimer down, but the Leftover's recovery just keeps stacking up eventually leading to Brion's demise and my victory. Not too bad at all. And what's even better is that there is no required fights between here and our next major fight against Gladian. He only has two Pokemon as well, and though his Zubat's pretty easily dispatched thanks to Rattata and three bites, taking a few wing attacks in the process, his true menace is Type Null. This thing is surprisingly bulky for this point in the game and can hit like a small truck, so I just stay in with Rattata, using two assurances to whittle down some HP as two tackles brings Rattata into the low yellow. So out comes Grimer for some cleanup duty, taking tackles as Acid Spray starts landing, lowering his special defense drastically, but this damage is adding up, so I swap strategies and go for Disable to get rid of Tackle for a bit, then set up six Hardens to outpace his damage output with Leftovers Recovery. This takes about two disables, but Pursuit is easily outpaced once the six Hardens are established, allowing Grimer to continue a Poison Gas and with Acid Spray, KOing in two more shots and winning the battle. Despite training this thing in physical attack, Acid Spray can get pretty nasty with the minus two special defense every turn. And I'm completely fine on waiting for a physical dark type move later while using this. That cleans up just about everything before Lana's trial though, so I went back to Melee Melee Island, Eevee trained as much as humanly possible, getting things right up to level 20 since these next few level caps are rather squished together. The Totem Wishy Washy's ready to battle, but fortunately so is my newly evolved Raticate. The only attacking move Wishy Washy has is Water Gun, and since Raticate can learn Confide, I can easily lower his special attack, but for some reason he uses Soak, changing Raticate's typing to water and making it resist Water Gun. This just makes my life even easier, as Leftover's recovery and Confide continue to make his attacks useless, though the other Wishy-Washy's helping hand makes it a bit stronger. After six Confides to the Totem and four to the Assistant, I'm able to start laying in with Tail Whip. The Assistant Wishy-Washy has Growl, so those have been piling on, and getting minus six defense is probably the only way to fix that. During this process though, Raticate finally gets hit with a critical, and it doesn't do that much since I'm water type right now, And but it definitely does put Raticate on a significantly shorter clock, but once that minus six defense is established, I can start laying in with Assurance, using three of them on the totem before his Citrus Berry triggers, then using three more to pick up the KO, but not before one last critical puts Raticate down to 12 HP. One Assurance takes out the Assistant Wishy Washy, ending the fight and giving me the Watery MZ. Not sure if I'll end up using this one, but I will take it nonetheless. With that in hand though, there's not much holding me back from just heading straight to Kiawe's Trial, whose level cap only increases by two levels, so there's not much to worry about training-wise. Before heading in there though, I made sure to get the rest TM from the Royal Avenue's Thrifty Mega Market, as well as the TM for Rain Dance from the Pokemon Center also there. So it could come in handy weakening the damage from the totem Salazzle, seeing as it's fire type, not to mention we've got another totem afterwards that Rain Dance is going to help against. After we get out of the Battle Royale, thankfully unscathed, I'm able to head to the Whale of Volcano Park and capture myself a Cubone. Thankfully for me, I get one with Lightning Rod, so Marowak will retain the electric immunity that Cubone has as a ground type. Now I'd love to say one more EV training session before the trial, but I do need one more thing. I grabbed the amulet coin from Paniola Ranch, then challenged a bunch of trainers I skipped to get everything to level 22, giving me enough money to purchase TM17 Protect from the Hey Hey City Pokemon Center. This should absolutely come in handy and can help with cheesing some fights thanks to double leftovers recovery turns. The Totem Salazzle kind of just falls like a ton of bricks, getting one shot by Cubone with Bone Meringue because it's quad weak to it as a poison fire type. 
I would have loved to use Diglett here, but I was not risking a Flame Burst one-shot, since it's part Steel-type. One more totem to take care of on Akala Island, and that's with Mallow's Trial in the Lush Jungle. Thankfully before then though, I can get both the TM for Flame Charge, which doesn't do anything now, but will when Cubone evolves, and a Thunderstone, finally evolving Pikachu into a Alolan Raichu and adding on that Psychic Typing. Great, another weakness to bug. And just in time, as Totem Lorantis has x Scissor. So my team is massively weak against most things this thing can throw at me, with the exception of Grimer. But being part dark just cancels out the poison resistance to bug, so we'll have to play as safe as possible. This totem has a Power Herb, which is able to charge Solar Blade in one turn, so I figured leading off with Grimer is the best bet. If I can get this thing poisoned, I can start whittling away at it, though the first poison gas misses. This is fine though, as I can just protect to get some more leftovers recovery, using another poison gas, and of course. Because Grimer is uber slow, the assisting Trumbeak is able to land the 55% accurate supersonic. <sighs> That's not good. If Grimer doesn't hit this next poison gas, I'm screwed and probably going to lose the fight. But thankfully, my protect goes through to stall for a turn, getting some more recovery and allowing poison gas to land on the next turn after getting out of confusion. But it does leave Grimer with only 6 HP. Guess we won't be using him for the rest of the fight, so I use protect just for some more poison damage, also thankfully getting rid of Lorantis' power herb in the process before swapping for Diglett. I can safely do this because x Scissor will not do enough to KO with any of Trumbeak's moves coming at me as well, but that doesn't do much in the grand scheme of things. If I had put Protect on Diglett, I would have gotten another turn out of it, but alas, we're stuck swapping for Raticate. Immediately on switching, I get my Chestoberry plucked by Trumbeak, very unfortunate since Rest was going to be my recovery option of choice for stalling out Synthesis, probably should have seen that coming and stuck with Leftovers. Another supersonic lands though, again 55% accurate, so I swap for Persian as the second synthesis comes down. Two out of five have been successfully eliminated, so I go for Fake Out on Lorantis to add on some more damage, avoiding Trumbeak's supersonic as Poison nearly KOs. So I go for Growl to nullify Lorantis' ability to KO with Solar Blade, unfortunately taking a supersonic before Trumbeak goes down to Poison damage. Immediately out comes Cast Form to take its place, which makes this even worse as Sunny Day makes Solar Blade a one-turn move. But upon seeing Lorantis go below half, I think Synthesis is coming, but instead he goes for the Solar Blade, doing massive damage to Raticate as I use Rain Dance. Rain Dance has the power of Solar Blade, but not like it's gonna matter because Cast Form immediately fires off a second Sunny Day, but not before Lorantis goes for another Solar Blade being stuck in another Charge turn. This is fine, since I'm not planning on using Raticate for the Elite Four, and this is a fine place to stack him to getting taken down by a Solar Blade. This puts Lorantis into the red, so I can go into Persian, hit a Fake Out to ensure another Synthesis doesn't come out, leaving it to fall to Poison Damage as Cast Form's Weather Ball does over half to Persian. The biggest threat is gone, but we've gotta get rid of this Cast Form, so I swap into Raichu, taking a Weather Ball for over half again. Yeah, I'm not one-shotting this thing, so I swap once again into Cubone, my last full HP Pokemon, and thankfully he goes for Headbutt, doing barely anything as the sun runs out. Water Gun doesn't do much to Cubone as two Bone Meringues are able to finish her off, winning me the battle and the Grass DMZ. Losing Raticate does suck since that was a nice little tank I had there, but I'll manage. Totem Lorantis is often a pretty big run killer, so I'm not disappointed with only one loss here. One more trial left on this island, that being Kahuna Olivia's battle. But before I can get to her, I gotta travel to Kani Kani City through Diglett's Tunnel, and oh boy, this place has some nice TMs. Two of which I'm interested in are of Bulk Up and Shadow Claw, but I've only got the money for the former. Probably should have reassessed my team setups after losing Raticate though, seeing as it was the only member of my available Pokemon that can learn Bulk Up, but alas, we'll get Shadow Claw later. For now, I've got to plow through Plumeria to get to Olivia, which is pretty easy. Throwing a Person Berry onto Raichu for her Golbat allows for a free two-shot, though Electro Ball was pretty close to one-shotting. Might have actually gotten it with Psychic, but no matter, as her last Pokemon, Salandit, falls to that very move, getting her out of the way for Olivia. Now, I've got to say, the walkthrough I was using to get through as fast as possible had Olivia listed at level 26, so that's what I trained for, but turns out her Lycanroc is level 27. Not that big of a deal, but I figured I'd point it out. 
Cubone is an MVP of this fight, as her lead nose pass has two electric moves and a rock move, so she's only able to use rock slide while I alternate between bone meringue and protect, allowing for the leftovers to keep Cubone at full HP. Two shots of bone meringue are able to put nose pass out of commission, leading to Bulldore. Now both this and nose pass have sturdy, which was the initial reason I'm using bone meringue, but it's not like I'm able to one shot with the multi hit move, so it really doesn't matter. Bulldor is able to survive a Bone Meringue on over half HP, so two more are needed to pick up that KO, though a Super Potion adds another one to that count before it finally goes down, leaving just Lycanroc. Now I'm using Protect to see if I can bait out the Z move, but he doesn't go for it, instead using the neutral Bite. Bone Meringue takes him into the red as a second Bite comes down, so Protect once again is the choice to get more recovery and possibly mitigate the Z move, but once again it doesn't come out, allowing for a second Bone Meringue to pick up the KO and the win. Huh, I guess because Cubone resists rock, she didn't end up using it? I don't know. I'm just happy I didn't lose any more Pokemon. Well, now that I have the Rock DMZ in hand, I'm going to be putting it to good use next trial. More story, more story, Nihilego, who I'm able to run away from before we go to Ula Ula Island, immediately leading into another rival battle against a Lolan Hop. So you actually don't get a choice to change around your party before this fight, so I made sure to put the newly evolved Doug Trio up front before Nihilego before this fight. First out is Raichu, no surprise, so I've got a nice magnitude 8 to rip through this thing, with Doug Trio tanking a Psychic on half HP as the new Flareon comes in. I just use Protect for a turn to decide what I'm going to do next, then swap into Grimer as Fire Fang does half. Well, shoot, maybe I should have kept the leftovers on instead of giving Grimer the hard stone for fling. So I once again protect and swap, this time to Persian, taking less than half from Fire Fang, as Fake Out and Protect are able to stack three turns of recovery. So I start going for Swift, but a burn comes, and essentially makes leftovers useless. Thankfully, I still have another turn that I can stay in and use Swift, though, so I do, getting Flareon close to half HP as another Protect stalls another power point. Well, I've only got two more Pokemon at full HP, so I swap into Cubone, taking a Fire Fang for less than half again, as Leftovers is able to give me that double recovery with Protect. Then Bone Meringue's able to land after a second Fire Fang, KOing Flareon and leaving just Breon. Well, I sure am glad my last full HP Pokemon is Raichu, so after using Protect and blocking Breon's super effective Z move on 3 HP, I'm able to swap into Raichu, taking a Bubble Beam for less than half, and run out two Electro Balls to pick up the KO and the win. Well, that was awfully scary. Very happy he used the Z move there instead of waiting on the switch in. That could have been a really nasty loss there. I'm starting to realize why people don't do Sun and Moon Nuzlocks in the community all that often. These things are really difficult and sometimes take pretty decent luck. Anyway, we've got some really nasty good TMs here in Mali City. The first of which I buy right off the bat is Swords Dance. Setup moves are often pretty nasty in Nuzlocks, so I'll definitely be using that with Marowak coming up shortly, and seeing as after I take care of some story stuff, Kukui takes me up to Mount Hokulani, where I've got to fight Mulane before taking on the next totem Pokemon. He's got higher level Pokemon than the totem Vikavolt, so I'm gonna have to go in at a slight disadvantage as I see Skarmory out first. My newly evolved Marowak should be able to take this fight handily though, as she resists Metal Claw and doesn't take more damage from Air Cutter, so with some Protect and Leftovers Recovery, I'm able to set up two Flame Charges for speed, then use three Sword Stances to max out Marowak's attack, allowing for a Flame Charge Sweep to KO Skarmory, Alolan Dug Trio, and Matang all with one shot each. Can't be too disappointed with that, but now that we've got Marowak evolved, we've got a really heavy hitting diverse team of fighters here, though a major weakness to ground is appearing. Marowak, Dugtrio, Raichu, Grimer, four out of our current five team members are weak to ground, and our next member will be quad weak. Here's hoping Persian can handle any problems that may arise. The next totem Pokemon is Vikavolt, and quite frankly, I thought I'd be able to swap around my Pokemon before fighting it, but I can't, so we're stuck with Persian in the lead. Not fully healed, no less, as I had to take out a Grubbin and two Chargebugs before this. Kind of frustrating to say the least, but Fake Out and Protect sort of helped to mitigate this. Not like Persian will be any help though, as Bug Bite is going to be nasty if it lands. So I swap into Doug Trio, seeing a Charge and Thunder Wave, both of which doing nothing to advance the game state. So here's where the Rocket EMZ comes in. Since Vikavolt's a bug type, I'm able to land it for massive damage, 
crunching it down to about a third HP left, as Rock Tomb and a Sucker Punch are plenty to follow up with the KO, leaving the assisting Charge Bug. Despite Mud Slap starting to come from it, Rock Tomb still lands at minus two, lowering his speed and making it so a second Rock Tomb could come out first, KOing and winning me both the Electrium and Steelium Z. Both of those should help out thanks to Raichu and Doug Trio and maybe even Golem, but for the time being, I gotta get my bum over the Tapu Village, though there is one major fight in the way of that goal. Guzma decides to get in the way and thinks he's all high and mighty, so let's rip apart his little bitty team. He leads with Galissapod, so I use Raichu, protecting so that first impression cannot connect, and then electroballing him out of the fight thanks to emergency exit. Now that Ariados is in, I can use Charm, lower his attack by two stages, and swap out into Marowak, setting up three sword stances in the face of Sucker Punch, so of course I opted to stall the last two power points of that with Protect, KOing with a Flame Charge after Fell Stinger lands for a grand total of three damage. You already tried that earlier on in the fight! You literally have Shadow Sneak! Why didn't you use that? I don't know. Galissapod's back in with red HP, so I protect the first impression and KO with a flame charge. See you later, bud. We'll talk to you again. Tapu Village is next on the docket, and on the way, I'm able to capture myself in a Lolan Geodude. Being ground electric type means I'm quad weak to ground, very frustrating to say the least, but at least it has sturdy, so we can use it as a nice pivot, if nothing else. I decided to EV train this thing in HP and attack. After all, it gets really nice physical attacks like Rock Blast, Thunder Punch, Brick Break, and Earthquake, and Golem has a sky high defense stat along with Sturdy, like I said. So, what's the point of giving any of the defenses any attention when the higher HP can be used to get more out of Leftovers Recovery? Anyway, Acerola Trial Time, and Totem Mimic is a bit of an annoyance. This has Gen 7's form of Disguise, so it doesn't take 1 8th damage from Disguise being busted. Not to mention, when I'm leading with Doug Trio here, Metal Claw misses! 95% accuracy be cursed! So I go for Bulldozers as Haunter comes in, bursting the Disguise as Doug Trio dodges a Hypnosis, giving me the time needed to use the Steelium Z, Corkscrew crashing Mimikyu for some heavy super effective damage, bringing it down into the red as Haunter does big damage with Shadow Claw. I swap for Grimer, taking an Astonish and Hypnosis, but Leftovers Recovery should be able to help here. Ah, <laughs> never mind, Play Rough is a very nasty move. I swap out once again, this time into Golem for the defensive capabilities, taking a Play Rough for less than half, and firing back a Thunder Punch to KO Mimikyu on 19 HP. Haunter's all that's left, so swapping into Persian, taking a Nightshade, and firing off Protect and Shadow Ball is the play, KOing and thankfully letting me pass without any knockouts. This entire run has been putting me on edge. It always seems like you can lose a Pokemon at any time if you're not careful, and even if you are, you're probably going to get your strategy screwed over since most of this AI is not exactly foolproof to take down. Either way, straight after we've got another fight with Plumeria, so I'm going with a similar strategy to last time, but instead of Raichu, I'm using Golem, KOing Golbat after using the Person Berry to heal off Confusion with Thunder Punch, then taking out her Salazzle with a two-hit Rock Blast after taking a light Flame Burst. All of this set up to get our attention over to Poe Town. Well, I guess that's where we're going next, but before I go in there, I gotta grab the TM for Poison Jab. This will be super useful for Grimer, as I can finally have a Poison-type option that hits for damage, unlike how Acid Spray was doing earlier on in the run. Guzma's at the head of the town and still only has two Pokemon, so I just go for Doug Trio, using Protect to block a potential first impression, but instead seeing Razor Shell, then going for the Z-move Continental Crush, taking out Galissapod with a critical hit and leading into Ariados. Now, Rock Tomb's a pretty safe option here, but I'm considering swapping as well, and quite frankly, that's the better option, seeing as Glug Trio... Glug Trio? What a frickin' name. <laughs> Doug Trio's a glass cannon, swapping into Golem and taking Ariados out with a three-hit Rock Blast after a very light Fell Stinger winning the battle. Alright, sweet. We've got the Aether House kids' young goose back, I've got a Bug and EMZ, and oh boy, they kidnapped Lily and Gladiant's pissed at us for some reason. Gotta love when morons take their aggression out on you instead of the thing that actually caused their problem. Well, we've got another Golbat lead, but instead of seeing Confuse Ray, we see Poison Fang, doing a grand total of 8 damage to Golem as a 3-hit Rock Blast takes it out, leading into Type Null. 
This is exactly why I gave Golem Brick Break, as Titanol gets three-shotted by Brick Break after some protect stalling for leftovers recovery and throwing out a few X scissors to attempt to damage Golem as his last Pokemon Sneasel comes in. Protect's able to get me a bit more recovery, then Brick Break shuts him down for good, taking a light faint attack in the process. Alright moron, let's go rescue your sister instead of fiddle farting around. Well, then again, I should probably fiddle fart around a little bit more, because I have a Kahuna battle to take care of before then. Nanu's here and ready to fight, so I am too, having edged my Pokemon for the first time in what feels like the entire run. I lead Muck as he goes Sableye, and I've got a neat idea here. I'm gonna stall him out of Power Gems with a mix of Minimize and Protect. This is exactly enough power points, minus the one from Fake Out that Protect blocked, but to get rid of the 20 points of Power Gem, I'm able to use all 19 of the remaining power points of those two moves, then use a Crunch to get it down to half damage, giving me the perfect opening to swap for Persian, though this is where it gets tricky. Nanu actually swaps the same turn as I swap into Crocorock. Well, here comes my ugly ground weakness. At least I'm into the Pokemon that is the only thing that isn't weak to ground. I can at least fake out this thing as it comes in the same turn as Persian, but I can't do much else. Instead, just going for Protect to block an Earthquake, then decide what I'm gonna do. I think going for Power Gem's my only option, doing a little bit of damage as Swagger misses, thankfully, so I go for it again, landing a critical as Swagger finally lands to confuse me. Now, I'm not interested in Confusion and Earthquake making a nice mix of KOing Persian, so I swap into Golem, safely taking an Earthquake because of Sturdy, then swapping back to take an Earthquake for 40 damage, then using Protect and Power Gem to take this cursed thing out. Seriously, I need to go back and get Volpix, since the Ice Stone's available now, maybe that would have been the play. Either way, his own Persian's out next, and has a relatively similar moveset to me, aside from having the more optimal Dark Pulse that I can't get right now. So I use Protect and Work Up, seeing Power Jump come out and do relatively high damage, so I do this dance again, protecting and taking another Power Gem before blasting out one of my own. However, I notice that I can survive another one off of Leftovers Recovery as long as it doesn't crit. But that's not a risk I'm willing to take, so I swap back into Muck, take a Power Gem, and take another before hitting a Poison Jab to nearly KO. Even the poisoning doesn't barely finish him off, but Nanu's an idiot and gives his Persian, that's 1 HP, a full heal, giving me a free turn to KO with Poison Jab, leaving just the half-alive Sableye. Alright, well, I'm gonna be a bit stubborn here, as Sableye only has Fake Out and Shadow Ball to hit Persian with. So I swap back and attempt the Protect Workup combo I had planned on using at the beginning of the fight to sweep with Power Gem. But of course, Shadow Ball gets the special defense drop on the first landing of it. So after protecting, I say screw critical hits again, swapping for the last time into Muck to grab that KO with Crunch. Finally winning this goddamn war of attrition. Like I said after the Totem Mimikyu fight, it seems like every fight is not as foolproof as I had imagined, and the AI actually has the intelligence to swap out when Sableye isn't optimal anymore. Not to mention, that thing didn't miss a single Power Gem despite Muck being at plus 6 evasion for most of that. I looked up Power Gem and it's not an Aerial Ace-esque move, so I have no idea what was going on there. Anyway, we've got a few story beats to take care of, including some battles with Faba that are hardly worth mentioning before I'm able to take on Guzma for the third and final time. And while his team is certainly less miserable, we're still working against bug types, and speaking from experience, these things usually suck. Leading off is Galissapod, so I go with Doug Trio as my lead, using Protect to hedge against a potential first impression, then go for Continental Crush for over half as Emergency Exit takes him out, bringing in Pinsir. This is perfect, seeing as Marowak can come in, and the only attack he has to touch me with is Hex Scissor, which cannot do any damage to Marowak whatsoever when you stack double leftovers recovery turns with Protect. So I just set up three sword stances and begin firing off flame charges. A single flame charge takes out Pinsir, hitting one more pitiful X Scissor before falling. Galissapaw's out to finish his daily pain quota, falling to a second flame charge after more Protect leftovers recovery. Plus 2 speed on Marowak should be enough to take care of Ariados, and it sure is, though I do make sure to stall out his 5 power points of Sucker Punch beforehand, since he still doesn't know how to click Shadow Sneak for some reason, KOing and leaving Masquerade. Now this thing I was never outspeeding, but I do survive an Air Slash with half HP, KOing with one last Flame Charge. 
Not too bad, but Lusa means immediately after, and she's got a really nice, diverse team to take on. Her lead is a Clefable with Cosmic Power, Moonblast, and Metronome, though, so I think you know what we're doing. Marowak's gonna sweep once again, taking a Moonblast for barely anything as I set up some speed boosts with Flame Charge first, getting two of them off as she keeps firing off Moonblasts. However, she gets smart of the scheme, swapping to Milotic on a Protect turn. Well, that ended poorly. Guess I've gotta go into Muck and do some stall shenanigans on these Hydro Pump power points. She's only got five, so I take one for less than half on switch in, and the second with a protect, then use minimize to mitigate the landing as she uses safeguard, giving me another free point gone with protect. Three out of five are down as a fourth misses, good stuff, and a second minimize gets set up, and next turn ends her hydro pump reign of tyranny, leaving the last minimize to be set up. Well, I may as well just attack, I guess. And attack I shall. Muck KOs Kylotic in three crunches, fully healing with leftovers before Beware comes in second. Now, this thing is generally pretty bulky and powerful, but Gunkshot is easily able to dispatch her with a critical and a second non-crit. Very nice. Minimize is really working out as Clefable comes back in third and dies to Gunkshot, leaving Miss Magius and Lilligant to fall to a crunch and Gunkshot respectively, winning me the match. That is probably the weirdest outcome that could have happened there. Attempted Marowak sweep, derailed by swap into Milotic, which is then re-railed into a muck sweep of all things. Oh, <laughs> I don't know what to say anymore. Anyway, more story, more story, I don't care, I'm going to Pawnee Island. There's two items I want here before heading to Executor Island, those being the Alorai Chium Z, I think that's how I pronounce it, the exclusive Z move for Alolan Raichu, usable with Thunderbolt, which may come in handy during the Pokemon League, and TM's Force Stone Edge and Focus Blast. Now I'm not sure if these will 100% come in clutch later, but I figured why not have them, they're rather useful in general. Now I can head to Executor Island, grab my Alolan Executor with a Quick Ball, and grab the Flute here on the island and head back over to the Pawnee mainland, as we are closing in on the Grand Trial. A few Skull Grunts are in my way, easily dispatched before I can fight Hapu. And I'm gonna preface right here, uh, this is a really weird friggin' part of the game. Hapu's level cap is 48, but the Totem Koma-O immediately after is level 45, so I brought five of my Pokemon up to level 48 for this fight, and left Raichu, Muk, and Golem in the box at level 43 to ensure I can get past Koma-O later. I've got eight Pokemon, by the way, because I went back to the Tapu Village and captured myself in Alolan Vulpix and evolved it into Ninetales with the Ice Stone, but that's beside the point. Hapu's actually not much of a problem, as our Doug Trio mirror match results in mine outspeeding and KOing with Earthquake leading to Mudsdale. Well, I'm gonna need Executor to get around this weakness, taking the Tectonic Rage Z move for around half damage as I fire back with Bloon Doom via Leaf Storm, one-shotting Mudsdale as Flygon comes in third. And while I thought initially swapping for Persian was the play, turns out Power Gem does not play well with ground types, who would have thought? So I swap again for Ninetales, taking an Earth Power for less than half as Ice Beam annihilates this dragon out of the sky, leaving just Gastrodon. Swap into Executor, take a Muddy Water, and KO with Wood Hammer. Pretty simple procedure all things considered, winning me the battle and the Groundium Z. And that's the penultimate trial of the run. Four more required trainers stand in the way between me and the Dragonium Z, and holy moly, does this awkward level cap make it difficult. These trainers have between levels 46 and 47 Pokemon, while I'm working with only three level 43s, so working through them was a chore. The first wasn't too bad, as he had two Fire-type Pokemon that I could easily dispatch with Golem thanks to a Continental Crush on his Torkoal, and a few other moves to follow up on Arcanine, but it did get to red HP. Not shocking because of the level disadvantage, but the trio right at the end were easily the most stressful part of the game. The Ace Trainer only had Absol and Lapras, easily outable by Muck thanks to the new Toxic TM that I got from the Aether Paradise, as well as Protect and Minimize stalling out, but that only works for this trainer. The second has a Klefki, a part Steel type that just cannot be touched with Toxic, and Stoutland is also a house, using Roar relatively often and forcing Muck to swap out instead of getting Protect Recovery turns, and of course nullifying Minimize, but at least her last Pokemon Serena's relatively graceful, only using Captivate as the only move she's relatively fond of. The last veteran in the lineup though has four Pokemon, and Granbull's got Roar. Shocking, right? 
While I tried immediately firing off my Z-move to take this thing out of the equation, and sure, it does three-fourths of her HP, but Roar comes in once again. This time, though, it swaps me into Raichu, so I take the risk, stay in, using Protect to see what move she'd use, then Electro Ball to pick up the KO. Also during this fight, Golem learns Explosion. Now, why would we want to learn Explosion during a Nuzlocke? Well, we wouldn't, it's just that Golem's not coming into the league with me, so that's probably the best thing I can be doing with it in a tight spot if I ever need an easy out to it. Speaking of explosions, swapping Muck into one from an Alolan Golem was the right call, doing a ton of damage, but at least I didn't lose any Pokemon, leaving a Cloyster to fall to some Toxic Stall and a Gengar to Crunch, just barely overleveling Muck for the Dragon Trial. Yeah, I've got two usable party members for this. Now I'm terrified, but alas I go in, and thankfully this is pretty easy. Using the Psycheum Z that I got from a backtrack to Haina Desert on Ula Ula Island, I'm able to just Z-move all three of the Pokemon here with Raichu, taking out Jangmo-O, Hakamo-O, and Komo-O all with one-shots, as the latter two both are part fighting type. And while yes, Komo-O did have Protect, it was better I immediately fire off the move as Psychic would have picked up the KO on the second turn, and all I'd have to deal with would be a level 38 Hakamo-O assistant. Nothing too dangerous to say the least, though now that I have a Dragonium Z and a flute in hand, I think it's time to call upon an old friend. Use your flute, Tommy, and bring life to the Dragon's Zord. For when he combines with the Mastodon, Triceratops, and Sabertooth Tiger, a new fighting machine will be at our disposal. Oh, uh, I must have gotten carried away. I meant to summon a big old interdimensional lion. Well, unfortunately, that interdimensional lion does come through, bringing me to Ultra Space for the second and last fight against Lusamine. She's got the same team as before, just boosted up by the power of the Ultra Beasts, but Clefable's boosted in special defense, a completely irrelevant stat to Marowak. So we're trying it again, baby. I'm going for the sweep, alternating Flame Charge and Protect for the first two turns, then using Sword Stance in case she decides to swap here, but she doesn't, continuing to fire off Moon Blast, eventually deciding on a Cosmic Power. This is perfect for me to go for another Flame Charge, getting to plus two speed as another Moon Blast hits. She's got one new move here though, that being Moonlight, so she heals back to nearly full, so I feel like a second Sword Stance is fine here as she uses Metronome. She hilariously rolls Solar Beam, forcing her into a charging turn and getting blocked by Protect next turn. By the end of this War of Attrition, I'm plus six attack and plus three speed, finally taking out Clefable with a fourth Flame Charge to get to plus four speed. Sure enough, Milotic's out next, but Bone Meringue is an easy one-shot, even without that crit it would have done it, leading to Miss Magius outspeeding and using Pain Split. Weird, but it does next to nothing as Flame Charge connects and KOs, doing the same to Lilligant next turn and leaving just Beware. This thing has boosted defense, nothing too crazy, but it does make Flame Charge a three-shot with Pain Split, so I swap over to Bone Meringue to mitigate that, barely missing the KO as a Pain Split comes down to put her back to a third HP. I think Flame Charge can KO from this range though, so I just go for it, and I'm correct, sending Fluffle Bear to the graveyard. Guess you won't be setting your toy vendor or searching for polymerization this game, you nerd! Oh, wait, wrong franchise. Story, story, god, please let me out of this story, and thankfully this is basically the end of it, as I've got seven important fights to take care of before we're done with the run. After stuffing the lion into a Master Ball, I can head on over to Mount Lanakila for the trek up to the Pokemon League, consisting of a battle against Gladian before the elevator. Now I do try for another sweep here with Marowak on Crobat, alternating Flame Charge and Protect, but he's immediately swapping into Silvali to mitigate Flame Charge's usefulness. I guess this isn't bad though, since Bone Meringue should be able to take out his ace here, and sure enough, after taking a crunch, Bone Meringue does her over half, letting Marowak heal back out of critical crunch range with Protect, hitting one last Bone Meringue for the KO. Well, that's a worrisome foe out of the way at least, but Weavile's out next and I am not hitting anything else with Marowak for the rest of this fight, so I swap into Muck, using Toxic, then swapping between Minimize and Protect to stall this thing out of the game, eventually KOing after a minute of back and forth leading to Lucario. Oh, yeah. I forgot this thing had Aura Sphere. Well, that's fine, I can just protect for some more recovery, then use Crunch, doing about a fourth damage. That's not bad, so I just protect and do it again next turn, getting a defense drop this time and making Crunch a three shot instead. 
Well, sick. Didn't expect Muck to be putting in this much work here. But with that KO out of the way, all that's left is the half-dead Crobat. Well, Muck's got plus six evasion, so why not stay in here? Protecting and dodging in acrobatics to land Crunch for massive damage, and doing the same process again and KOing to win the battle. Though that second attempt at acrobatics did land, showing that if it landed the first time, Muck was dead. Probably a dumb move, but I do enjoy doing dumb things. Anyway, one victory road later, and by victory road I mean about a 45 second trek through. It's that short and filled with no trainers whatsoever. And while that makes my life easier, it does kinda seem weird. I'm just thankful that it makes my life easier. I deserve some ease on my heart right now. Last trainer before the league is a Alolan Hop, but before that I'm reteaching a few moves to my Pokemon now that I have access to the move relearner giving Raichu Thunderbolt for its exclusive Z-Crystal and for higher damage than Electro Ball, as well as a few other moves, so let's go for it. Alolan Hop leads off with a classic Raichu, and Doug Trio's right here to match its speed stat, KOing with Earthquake and doing the same to Flareon next turn. Not sure why he's going in order of his team here instead of going for Primarina, but that's fine as I can just take out his new Kamala with a Tectonic Rage, leaving just Primarina. He's absolutely going for Hydro Vortex here, so I swap into Executor to quadruple resist it, but since he's got Moon Blast, it's not the smartest thing to stay in afterwards. So I swap out for Muck, taking it with over half HP, then using Protect to get that double recovery turn. This battle's essentially sealed up as the Toxic lands on Primarina, so I've just gotta sit here and let this thing die. But I think I wanna be funny. I'm not bringing Golem into the league, and this is the last battle before then, so I'm swapping into it to attempt to get Explosion off. But of course I don't outspeed, just getting plowed through with Hyper Voice after a turn of Protect. Well, that's a shame. That would have been funny, but that leaves Raichu to just come in and pick up the KO with Thunderbolt, giving me that last victory needed to access the league. I'm going in with Ninetales, Executor, Raichu, Muck, Doug Trio, and Marowak. I've got a ton of offensive options, a few defensive options, and a whole crap ton of weaknesses to ground types. Glad the only thing I'll be taking ground type moves from will be Probopass against Olivia, but I'm getting ahead of myself. Before going in, I made sure to go around the region to grab a few helpful items for this, such as the Focus Sash, Earth Plate, and a few other neat things, but nothing too crazy. Do you guys think I can get through this Elite Four without losing any Pokemon? Leave a comment down below if I can or not, but let's rip into them. First up is Hala, and quite frankly, this is why I grabbed the Focus Sash. Giving it to Raichu makes this fight a cinch. As Protect blocks Hariyama's Fake Out, then I can safely set up a Nasty Plot and KO Hariyama, Primeape, Beware, and Crabominable all with one Psychic apiece, leaving just Poliwrath to be the odd guy out, falling to Thunderbolt instead. One down, four to go, and none of the other ones are gonna be nearly as easy. I figured the next easiest to take down, though, would be Kahili, leading off with a Skarmory that can't really touch my Marowak, so I just do the basic sweep, using two Flame Charges as she sets up two layers of Spikes, forcing her into a full restore as I use my first Sword Stance. This means that Flame Charge will put her right back into the red on the third layer of Spikes coming down, but that doesn't mean a second full restore comes out. Instead, I see a very light Steel Wing that's mitigated with double Leftovers recovery allowing Marowak to max out her attack with a third sword stance, though a critical steel wing connects while I'm doing so. It doesn't mean anything, but it connected. Anyway, Mandibuzz is out second, and even at plus six, Flame Charge is unable to one-shot, but Punishment cannot one-shot me, so I just stay in, hitting two of them to KO. Everything else is as easy as pie, though. Toucan and Crobat both go down to a Flame Charge each, leaving just Oricorio. Now unfortunately, this is the Fire Flying variant, so Flame Charge is a two-shot, but thankfully I've recovered enough HP to survive an Air Slash, finishing the sweep and winning the fight. Well, I guess that was slightly harder than Hala. Not by much, but it did have me slightly worried about criticals. Not that it mattered though, I don't think I'm using Marowak for many of the remaining fights. Third on the docket is Olivia, and I've got a weird thing here. She leads with Relicanth, so of course I lead with Raichu to one-shot with Thunderbolt, but I'm not sure what she'll go into second, so I've got Executor and Dugtrio both set up for this fight in case either are needed, and put Volt Switch on over Psychic to ensure that I can break the sturdy of either Probopass or Golem if they come in. And sure enough, she actually goes for the former, her only Pokemon with a ground-type move in Earth Power, so I go for Volt Switch to get the hell out of dodge, swapping into Executor to take that Earth Power for light damage. 
I've got a Cherry Berry on here, so I can safely set up a Sword Stance while that comes down, giving me plenty of firepower behind Seed Bomb, but not enough apparently, as it barely doesn't hit the red. But of course that's fine as it can set up a second on the full restore turn, though it does basically guarantee paralysis from Thunder Wave. A second full restore comes out of Olivia as I bring Probabast back down into the red with Seed Bomb, but Paralysis finally catches up to Executor, staying immobile for two turns in a row and requiring me to swap out. I go back into Raichu since she's definitely not going for Earth Power here, and I'm correct, seeing Sandstorm instead. Thunderbolt KOs leading to Lycan Rock, and I'm not surviving a Rock DMZ, but I can try to protect to bait it out, it doesn't happen, instead seeing Crunch, so I Volt Switch next turn into Duck Trio, seeing a Crunch do over half as I go for the Tectonic Rage. I'm not dealing with the Z-move, it's just too much to worry about in this fight, but I'm at least able to KO it. Fourth is Carbink, and Iron Head is quite effective against it, so it kills it immediately, leaving just Golem. Now this thing has Sturdy, and as much as I'd love to stay in here and hit a quad effective Earthquake, I'm afraid Steamroller will KO Doug Trio from here. So I swap into Muck here, whom I've taught Brick Break for this battle, putting me at a massive advantage. Though I do sort of lose that advantage upon seeing Thunder Punch paralyze on literally the first landing of it. Great. At this point though, it's just of a war of attrition, once again, Brick Break versus Thunder Punch, and Thunder Punch wins out here. Though two Brick Breaks does take it down to half HP, so I swap back into Doug Trio, tanking a Thunder Punch with that immunity, and outspeeding next turn to KO with Earthquake. Well, that fight took a bit more thinking, glad I prepared my brain for some of that, but I'm going to have to put some more thinking in as Ace Roll is last on the list of the Elite. The beginning of the fight doesn't exactly require much thought though, as I can just lead with Ninetales. Protecting the Fake Out from Sableye and Calm Minding next turn, taking a Confuse Ray that's luckily negated by a Held Person Berry that I thought ahead for, picking up the KO with a Dazzling Gleam next turn. Not sure why she sent out Delmize next, but Slam does a decent amount of damage. So after using a second Calm Mind, I KO with Ice Beam, leading into Palace Sand. Now I'd love to go for Ice Beam here, but that Ghost Z move will 1000% bring down Ninetales here if I use it. So I swap into Muck, being outpredicted as she goes for Earth Power. Not too often the AI outpredicts me, but that's fine as Muck outspeeds, nailing a Black Hole Eclipse as my Z move for the battle to KO and take her move out of the equation. Two left as Frostlass comes out, and while this thing is rather worrisome, I don't think it can KO Muck from this position, so I just use Protect and stay in with Crunch. And while Confuse Ray does connect, Muck doesn't hit himself, KOing Frostlass in one shot and leading to her last Pokemon, Drifblim. Now this thing only has Ominous Wind as an offensive option, so I can basically take it out with anything. So I'm going into Executor here, alternating Protect, Sword Stance, Protect again, and Dragon Hammer to bring her into the red. Well, uh, Full Restore is coming next, so a second Sword Stance and a Dragon Hammer combo is able to finish her as well as the Elite Four off, with one final trial remaining. I may be the champion, but Kukui shows up like a dickhead to challenge me for the title the same day I won it. Jeez, I didn't expect Kukui to be John Cena to my Rey Mysterio WWE title reign, but I guess this is what we're dealing with. He leads off with a day form of Lycanroc, so I go with Raichu. Now I've got a Culverberry to lower the damage of Crunch in the efforts to set up a nasty plot on his team to try to sweep from there, but I figured using Protect first to tell me what he goes for would be smart. And he doesn't go for Crunch here, instead going for Stone Edge. So I swap into Executor, finishing the 5 power points of Stone Edge, while kinda just fiddle farting around with Swords Dance. I'm not actually using Executor to sweep here, rather I'd like to get rid of these points, and holy moly it would be nice if Guy missed a Stone Edge. Alas, I swap into Muck on the last Stone Edge, and it's a bit of a war here, alternating Minimize and Protect to get that recovery and to stall, but this mother keeps landing Accelerock. Again, I checked this move to see if it had Aerial Ace properties. It doesn't, he's just getting stupid lucky. Thankfully, he moves over to Crunch, meaning we're taking less damage, and I can safely KO with two Brick Breaks, though Muck is almost taken out of the fight because of it. Second out is Snorlax, and while I can protect and heal a bit more, I'm not surviving any attacks from this thing after I land a Brick Break, so I just get it for nearly half, getting KO'd by a Heavy Slam. So long, good friend, you will be missed until the save file is deleted in five minutes. 
I went into Doug Trio to attempt the KO with Earthquake, but I barely miss it. Seeing a high horsepower come out, and thank god it missed. Doug Trio would have fallen immediately, but I am able to follow up with a Sucker Punch for the KO, leading into Incineroar. I get it, fire is super effective against steel, but this thing is far too slow, falling to Earthquake. Should have had Intimidate on this one, bud, maybe you would have survived. Half his team down and out comes Nine Tails, an unfortunate target for my quad effective Iron Head, which leads to Braviary. Well, normal and flying moves shouldn't do too much, and flinching with Iron Head would be nice, but that doesn't happen. Instead, seeing a Whirlwind drag out Marowak, so I just run with it, using Sword Stance as he unfortunately goes for Tailwind. Guess this sweep's not sticking around as Whirlwind hits through Protect, dragging out Raichu. Well, I can't help but just use a super effective attack here. Taking a Crush Claw on only 9 HP is Thunderbolt KOs, leaving just Magnazone. This actually is insanely nice here, as I can Volt Switch with Raichu, break Magnazone's Sturdy, and absorb a Thunderbolt with Doug Trio for absolutely free, and grab that last KO with Earthquake, ending the match and finally earning me a victory in this Nuzlocke. And while yes, I did technically win on my first attempt through this game, I actually ran a lot of damage calculations and optimal move sets to ensure I would. And even then, some of this run went off the rails. In fact, I'd say the majority of this run went off the rails. Only two losses though is pretty appreciated, and if you enjoyed this Alola run, definitely make sure to check out my Moon Nuzlocke using only Kintonian forms of these Pokemon over on the Beast Coast Pokemon channel, link again is in the description. Despite it being the same species, the difference in types of movesets is actually staggering. As for next week, I'm not sure what I'll be running, but I'll probably do an easier run to offset the hell I put myself through to make two of these videos in a week. See you guys then! If you guys enjoyed this video, make sure to like, comment, subscribe, click the bell, tell a friend, and don't spend more than a minute doing that, since if you are, you're taking too long. I want to give a huge shout out to my $5 and above patrons, Justin Dimenstein, Aiden Brannon, Andy, Casper Kirkpatrick, Heimflo, Jacob Johnson, Sean McKay, Zeno, Aaron H., Aaron Ladeau, Austin Rose, Box of Turtles, Cryptic Gamer, Leon Metalgray, and Zachary Kiever. Thank you all so much for your support. I'd also like to give a shout out to Fiery Dance. They helped make my new thumbnails as well as these cute layouts, and their link to commission them will be in the description. Anyway, if you'd like to support these videos, you can head over to my Patreon page, link in the description, where for only a dollar per month, you can get access to stuff like videos early, as well as an exclusive role in my Discord server, link also in the description. I really appreciate you taking the time out of your day to watch this, and I'll see you guys next time with another challenge. Stay safe, stay healthy, and I'll see you next time.